Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. Today is August the 18th, 2024, and uh, uh, we are going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to start off by saying to you, I sincerely apologize. I know that it no doubt was probably confusing for many of you the way I shared that message with you, but sincerely from my heart, the revelation that God was giving me was just unbelievable. But even I felt checked by the Holy Spirit. I was starting to get it confusing and, and really wasn't bringing it out the proper way that would edify our Heavenly Father most of all and also be a true blessing for you. It is not, I, I actually titled the first part of that teaching, Freeing Women by Redemption. But it's really and truly freeing both men and women, and we're going to get into that today, and uh, And I am very excited. I, I went back. I knew something wasn't right. I actually wrote Brother Ron. I told him, I said, Brother Ron, I, I felt checked by the Holy Spirit. Something wasn't right. I knew that I did something wrong, and it didn't, he was not pleased with the way I was bringing this out. And so I sincerely went before the Lord, and he took me through it. And now I am so excited to be able to share it with you. And before we even get started, we're going to pray together because it's that serious of a message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, dear God, for your amazing grace, your amazing revelation. You are truly our Heavenly Father. You are truly our everything. And I think of the wonderful scripture that even my wife reminded me of this morning, that in that day you will know that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and I am in you, and you are in me. This is that true redemption. This is what Paul was speaking of in 1 Corinthians 11 that we so easily overlook, Father. And, and it's mainly because you taught in parables those hidden things for us to understand. So, Father God, I ask that you'll bless the things I'm about to say to the people's ears, that they have ears to hear and eyes to see, that they may be blessed and one with you. In Jesus Christ's name, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, for those that want to go by a different version in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. I say that, too, because, you know, that's kind of an odd thing, you know, peculiar, quite frankly. Uh, more and more I'm beginning to start seeing people make comments about, oh, you can't use the name of Jesus. You know, you got to use Yeshua. Uh, well, keep in mind, guys, there are four different ways I, that I know of in Hebrew of saying the name Jesus, and they all everybody has their own idea. Yehushua, Yeshua, Yeshu, Isu. Uh, I mean, and it goes on. And then every language in the earth, there is a different way that his name is pronounced. I do believe, though, that he knows the intents of our hearts. Let's not, we won't get into that. Uh, we're going to come back to this picture on the screen here in a little bit here because it actually has a lot to do with this whole story of 1 Corinthians. Moses at the burning bush, are you serious, Brother Steve? Yeah, believe it or not, it does. Um, I, I want to start, though, let's first, let's quickly, let's just look at Corinthians. There's two things I want to look at, 1 Corinthians 11, to kind of set the stage. And then we're going to go into these verses here so you understand the allegory that we have here or the types and shadows that are in there. And maybe as a reminder, let's look at Matthew 13, 13, right? First, we'll start with verse 11, right down to 13. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Think about that, right? So he spoke in parables. And oddly enough, when he revealed himself to his apostles, like, like for example, these writings from Egypt, they called the Nag Hammadi because they were found in that part of Egypt there. A lot of them were really, wow, they're like mind-blowing the way you read it. But the very 
uh, lady, the doctor that, that from Princeton University that actually give them the title Gnostic Teachings later in her life came back and said five of those books I should have called early Christian writings. She cites the very same passage I'm citing to you now, but from the Mark's Gospel. And she said, because we know that like in the secret book of James or, or the book of Thomas, et cetera, that are written in those that they've discovered there, that they tend to go into deeper understanding. She said, so therefore they wrote very much the way Jesus spoke to the public in parables, or at least in their case, they began to reveal what some of these in-depth teachings really meant. So that was her take on it. And I know that the book of Thomas is actually by many scholars, not just her, but by many scholars, believed to be that it should have been part of the canon. You'll see why. And we're going to kind of maybe discuss that just briefly in this, uh, this particular message. So we get that set. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. And I want to, to share with you, uh, and by the way, this is fascinating. Well, we'll save that for a little bit. <clears throat> Let's start with verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Okay? I want to stop that right there. And we're going to really get into this so it makes a lot more sense to you in just a little bit here. But we're going to go into the redemption side of all of this. When he says here the word head, kephale, the Greek word, if you go to the Koine Greek, the ancient Greek that was spoken at that time, the word kephale is also translated as source. Like, for example, even in English, we might say, you know, well, it's the head of the river. The head of the river is where the river began. In other words, the, maybe the artesian spring under the ground bubbling out that creates that river or that stream. And then that stream, a lot of other streams come down. They unite together and they make one big stream. And then, they get a, then you get a creek. And then from a creek to a creek, they all the creeks go into a river. But still there is a source from where these all began. And that source, oddly enough, well, that's, that's beautiful, too. That's another thought I just thought of. I'm thinking right now, let me just share with you what I'm thinking about, right? The rock that Moses smote at Horeb. Fascinating. Very fascinating there. Mount, Mount, or they say Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb, by the way, are side by side. There are mountains right there joining together. But from that rock flowed the water. That was the source. And it's oddly enough, right in that same area where Moses comes and stands there and God tells him to take his shoes off. You're going to know why he told him he took his shoes off. There's been all kinds of commentaries. And I don't know if anybody has ever said what I'm going to reveal to you today. But we'll go back into that in just a little bit, right? Let's just say, let's look at this though right now. But, but I would not, of course, you know, that, that the head of every man or the source of every man is Christ. He's talking about Jesus, the anointed one. The head of the woman is the man. Or the source of the woman is the man. Well, we're going to get into that in Genesis. That's You know, if, he's, if we know this is source, that this is where the, you're coming from, then we got to go back to Genesis and find out all this to be true. And the head of Christ or the source of Christ is God. Now, somebody made a comment in there. They said, well, you know, Christ, God cannot be a source for Christ because Jesus Christ, he is God. Well, Jesus says, I come from God, okay, and I go back to God. Wow. I come from God, and I go back from God. So his physicality on the earth was of course, God manifested in flesh, but that source, in other words, he came out of the Father and he came onto the earth. So therefore, that is why it is used as the word source. So I hope that helps the brother that made the common or sister, whichever one. All right. Now we're going to come back to the middle of this in just a moment, but let's go down further.
Let's see. Yeah, I think it's going to be verse 12 and verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. He's, it's refer, after you get all the little meat in between, or maybe the milk in between and the meat's on the outside here, right? Never, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. In other words, man didn't get here on the earth unless he came through the womb. Speaking of Christ, neither the woman without the man. Speaking of Eve coming from Adam. But notice, in the Lord because they were all in him beforehand. In other words, Christ, even though God is his source, he still came through the woman to get here. And even though uh, the woman is from the man, because when God also made man, he came from, the woman came from the man. That's why it says, in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, in other words, Eve came out of man, even so is the man also by the woman. Christ Jesus, in order to bring the redemption, came from E, or Mary. But all things of God. In other words, God is the source of everything. So it still comes right back down to that source. All right? So, now let's back up and let's start looking at things here. We're going to take a look at Genesis, and we're going to start with Genesis chapter 1. We're in verse 26, and it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now I'm going to be using Hebrew quite a bit in here, and it's not to to be of a show, but there is a very important reason for using it because there is an emphasis in words that are used in Hebrew that we don't have in English, and it will better help you to understand. Of course, I realize you're not going to understand half the words I'm saying, but you'll, you'll get the gist of what I'm getting into here in a little bit. So anyway, let us make man in our image. V'yom Elohim nasu adam. Okay, Nasu Adam be Selemenu Kidemoto, excuse me, Kidemotonehu ve Yaradu. All right, he makes them in here, he makes man, Nasu Adam, he makes the man, and he makes them, see, it's them, and let them. Have dominion over the fish, and I didn't read the part about that. Bedagat Hayam, okay, the fish of the sea, that's in the dark blue now. Ube of Hashemaim, literally, if you want to take it literally, it means the wings of the air. So they have dominion. They do. See, they do. There, there it is right there. That's where they have that dominion. So when God makes the man, or that physicality of flesh, Adam, he made them together as one unit. And they're going to be over the cattle, over the earth, over the every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Bara otam. Okay? Zacha unakeva. See, it says right here. Belatam Elohim bara oto. And God created them. Zacha unakeva. Male and female bara otam. Now, some people say, well, Genesis 2 is just going into more detail of what Genesis 1 did. No, it's not. Genesis 2 is going to go into the fact that they go into flesh. In the beginning, they're created in the image of God. Ah, really? Yes, they're created in the image of God. Let's see here. We're going to get into that in just a moment. And I think I should go into Genesis Two before I go into that image of God. All right. Hmm. 
Uh, you know what? I tell you what. Bef Ooh, no, I don't want to go into it yet. Let me let me stay where I'm at right here. All right. Now we get into Genesis chapter two. And the heaven and the earth uh, were finished, and all the host of them. And the seventh day, God finished His work, and He made and uh, that He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. All right. Now we get down to verse five. And he says here, No shrub of the field was yet in the earth, nor herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Now, notice right here, the avodah et adama, to literally to work the ground. There was not a man, but now the word man, adam, comes from those three letters right there from the ground or the earth, adam. Okay? Man came from the earth. But in Genesis 1, their male and female created he them. And he created them in the likeness of God. All right, now just briefly, we're going to take a quick peek over at Exodus. Just briefly. All right, let me. Back up, okay, or no, maybe I don't have to, yeah, here we go. And the angel of the Lord, uh, listen, let me back up. And uh, and now Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, in the priest of Midian, and he led the flock up to the fatherless end of the wilderness. And he came to the mountain of God unto Horeb. Okay, it's Mount Horeb, not Mount Sinai, but Mount Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. This is the main word I want you to see. Belibat Aish. Mitok Hasanai. Mitok is from the middle, the middle of the thorn bush. All right? But it was it was the angel of the Lord. He appeared in the very midst of the fire. Aish. All right. Keep that in mind. Now, we'll continue on a little bit. We're going to come right back to that. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see who? God called unto him out of what? The midst of the bush. What's in the midst of the bush? The Aish. In the middle of the bush is the Aish. Mm. In the middle of the bush is Aish. And it says, Ve'yara Yehovah kisar le'ra'ot. And Jehovah saw kisar le'ra'ot. That he turned aside, Veikara Eliav Elohim, and called out to him, God, Mitok Hasanai. God himself called out from the middle of the bush. Who was God then? The Aish, because the Aish was in the middle of the bush. And it says here, Veyomer, Moshe, Moshe, Veyomer. And the Lord said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. What am I emphasizing here, though? The middle of that bush is where God spoke from. The angel, by the way, the, why, why does it say Melech? The Melech is the form in which God took upon himself to express himself to Moses. Just like when Jesus Christ came on the earth, that was the form that God chose to speak out of the midst of that bush, so to speak. Out of the mid and why do I say bush? Because on him was a crown of thorns. When he stood there, when he was hung on the cross there, and he cried into, to the, out into, in an unknown language, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
from the midst of a thorn bush. It was a sign to Israel. Listen to this, my Jewish friends. It was a sign to you that the very God of heaven that was in the midst of this bush right here, the melach, the form that God took, which was an ash, the fire of God, was now hanging on a cross and speaking out through that cro- from that cross from the midst of the thorn bush all over again. But my emphasis here is the ash, the fire. Now you'll see why. Okay, now we'll see why. Let's go back to Genesis. Now we're in Genesis chapter 2. There was not a man to till the ground. Adamat. Adamat Adamat is the ground, the earth, the dirt, the soil. Adam comes from the fact that he comes from the dust of the earth, the physical body which God would make for him. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Ve'iyatsar Yehovah Elohim et ha'adama ha'adam, excuse me, ha'adam afar min ha'adama. See, that's why you see right here ha'adam, the man. Right, he get he gets his name. The very Adam, the word Adam comes because he's from. This is the part of him now that is from dirt. He's from dirt. Ve'ipak be'pa'av nishmar chayim. He breathes in his nostrils the very breath of life, the chayim. And like I've said so many times in many hundreds of videos, chayim is the plural form of life. And that life comes from where? From God himself. And why is it breathed in the plural form? If you've never listened to my teachings before, I'll tell you. Because Adam and Eve both were in that body. They were created in the image of God. The spirit, the life, the ash. They were created in that form there. And now he breathes them into that body. Their very life. Because why? where are they from? Where are they from? Paul told you right there in Corinthians where they're from. Right? He already told you where they're from. The head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is what? God. That anointing was breathed into the very body. And that woman was taken out of the man. But she was once inside that man because they were what? One, like you and the Holy Spirit. It's really a type of you and the Holy Spirit. You and God become one. That's why I say 1 Corinthians is redemption. It's not about whether or not a girl has long hair, short hair or not. It's redemption. And you're going to find that out today. So we go back. He breathes in him. What life? Just like we have the tree of life. Who's the tree of life? Jesus Christ is that tree of life. Just like we see, what is it in Zechariah, the golden lampstand. And there were, there were two branches on either side of the golden lampstand representing Moses and Elijah. Do you know why those two branches were on either side like that? It was showing... That when Jesus Christ come, that Moses and Elijah would come and stand at his side, showing that he was indeed that golden lampstand prophesied by Zechariah. The tree of life, the eight Chaim, okay? The eight Chaim. Who is the tree of life? We know Jesus Christ is the tree of life. The Jewish people want to tell you the Sephiroth tree is a tree of life. You know, and oddly enough, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, maybe I'll just say this now. Maybe I'll just say it now real quick. Let me find the right place for this, right? This is very fascinating. Um, Not John, maybe it's Matthew. Hmm. Yeah, it's in the book of Luke. This is actually also from Matthew 23. 
Remember Matthew 23 is where Jesus, he indicts the Pharisees for the blood going all the way back, all the way back to Abel. And then it says here, Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, then, and them that were entering in, you hindered. The lawyer. You know who the lawyers are? The Pharisees. In the book of Thomas, in that Nakamadi writings, there it is right there, is one of the sayings of Jesus. The Pharisees and scribes have received the keys of knowledge, but they have hidden them. Neither have they entered, nor have they allowed to enter those who wish to. You, whoever, be as shrewd as serpents, as innocent as doves. Why does he mean shrewd as serpents? Look for the keys. Because the Pharisees, as Jesus says, you are of your father the devil. He said, you serpents, you vipers, you generation of vipers. The only reason why Jesus said be as shrewd as serpents is, to, in other words, to find the keys of knowledge and unlock that door. Become one with Christ so that you can enter into the kingdom. All right. Now, we were in Genesis here. So the reason why I do that is to show you that tree of life. He is Christ. And the very life from that tree of life. See, people think, you know, when, they, when, when God guarded the tree of life, the way of the tree of life with these seraphim, so that the people did not eat and live, Boy, I could take you very deep on that right there. I'm going to let you figure that out. Let's just put it this way here. Once you have that life, in the plural, when you have the chayim, in a plural, not in a singular. See, look. Vehayaha adam le nefesh chaya. See, Adam, for his soul, for his soul was chaya. Chaya is the singular of Chaim. Chaim was plural because Eve was inside of him. Oddly enough, oddly enough, and here it is again, 1 Corinthians all over again. Oddly enough, in the book of Philip that was not canonized, he said, when the woman was taken out of Adam, death set in. If she ever comes back into her husband, death will cease to be. And again, it's an allegory, all right? It's an allegory because actually Adam and Eve, it types the Holy Spirit in you. Some of these things, people, they just see, they see the natural side of it, but they forget Jesus said, I speak to them in parables because it's not given for them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. You've got to understand that Eve inside of Adam at that time is a type of the Holy Spirit inside of him. Don't think of it as the carnal, because even now, when you and the Holy Spirit, you and Christ become one, then it is a chayim in you and not the chaya. Chaya is just life, and you could die with only the one singular. If you don't have the plural within you, you will die. You have to unite with your source. I still haven't got to the best part yet, though. Let's continue on. Let's see. I think we have to go into, let's see, hang on. Nope, nope, here it is, right there. Let me go, let me deal with this one real quick uh, as well. Because this is where women get belittled a lot. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And every man and minister today goes around sitting there saying, see, God has made you just as a helper. You're to be there to wash the dishes, cook, clean, and do the laundry and all that. That's your job. You're a helper. <laughs> do you realize that when God called her Ezer, do you know how many times that's spoken of of God to you? God is your Ezer or Ezra. 
Does that mean God is subordinate to you men? You, you think I'm kidding you? Let me just give you an example. All right, we're in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Let's just, let's go down here just to make it easy. Uh, let's take this up to Genesis chapter 2, and let's go down to verse 18. Okay, and I, him, and help. There it is, Ezer. H, 5828. All right, let's just type that in here. H, 5828. Boom. All right. Now, here we go. Right there, it applies to the woman. Okay? And it applies to her in verse 20. Then we get to verse Exodus 18.4. Uh, the God of my father said he was mine. What? Ezer. Help. Whoa. Now, God's the helper. Let's see, another one here. Let's see. Uh, like unto God and to uh, Yeshuran, who rideth upon the heaven, and thy help. Uh, the, uh, uh, o people saved by the, by the Lord, the shield of thy help. Oh my goodness, is God subordinate in all these cases? Waiteth for the Lord. He is our what? Our Ezer, our helper. Do you realize women, my wife, I heard her make this statement one time. He said, and I don't know if it's replying to this one. She said, but the woman was on the side of God. Yeah. In this case, yes. It's not a subordinate word, men. Throughout the entire scripture, I think three times it applies to women. The rest of the time it applies to God himself. Or not every single time, but a, a, a huge majority of these scriptures. Uh, my help cometh from the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Should we continue on? I know, I think we, everybody's got the picture of that. All right, so women, you don't worry about it. Kanegiro. Kanegiro is like corresponding or not, uh, it, literally it means against him. She is a help against him. It is a balancing out of the two. I don't want to waste no more time on that. Yeah, I think you got the picture of that. All right, but for Adam, there was not found a Ezer. You're kidding me. That's because she was inside of him. Think about that real deep. You sisters especially, really think about that deep. We could go a long way with that, but I'm going to hold back right now. Now we got to get into something very important. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. All right. Now, what did he make? Me, okay. <clears throat> made he a woman. La Isha. That's what he made. La Isha. He made a woman. <clears throat> In the middle of that name is Ish or Aish. Remember what we just discovered over here in Exodus? In the midst of the bush, belly butt, Aish. Where was the woman before God took her out of the man? Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? She was in the man, inside of him. The Aish. The fire of God. Notice the feminine is a hay. The last letter, the hay. Now, what does it say here? And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Isha. Right there. She shall be called the Ikaha Isha. Because Why? Because he says that, because, ki, me, eish, la kachazot. He didn't say she was taken from man. He actually says she was taken from ish. 
we translate that man, but we also translate Adam as man, right? Why does he say she's taken from Ish? Because inside of him is the very fire of Almighty God. Look at it right there. Notice it. Aleph Yod Sheen. In the middle of him, in the middle of his, his reference there is the Yod. Yod and the letter He from her right there makes Yah. God himself. She was taken from the midst of the fire. And in order for Christ to redeem us back, he had to be in the midst of the bush. And then you'll find out in a moment why Moses had to take off his shoes. So the Aish and the Ish, he says to her, he says about her, I, f I find it so beautiful, right? Oh goodness, I love it. La zot ikraha isha. He said, for this, I will call her isha. Ki, because, me ish. Me ish lakach zot. Because she was taken from the very fire of God that was inside of me and brought out. Do you know rabbis actually, you talk, Jesus said, you, woe unto you lawyers, woe unto you Pharisees. It was given you the keys of knowledge, but you hid it away. Because you don't enter in and you're trying to hinder those that would enter in. Enter into what? Enter back into Christ. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, the Father is in me. And I am in you, and you are in me. This is the greatest revelation you could ever possibly get from 1 Corinthians 11. And we haven't even got into the center of that yet. We will. Therefore shall a man, this is the beautiful part, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. What? It's like, where did that come from, right? I mean, Adam and Eve just got created. Eve just comes out. She has taken that light, that fire of God is taken out of the very center, the very life of God that was inside of the Adam because why they were created in the image of God, which was what? God's image was the fire, the H that was God in the center of the burning bush. He takes that out and then around that is formed a woman. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. That's a prophecy. Alkin. Ya azar ish. Whoa. Not a Adam. Ya azav ish. Therefore, it's almost like saying absolutely that fire of man will leave et aviv his father. And you know, that's even more beautiful than you can imagine. It's not just a av, father, singular, they put that little yod right there before they put his, his father's. Whoa. That's so beautiful. I, I, my, my, my whole spirit is just seeing every little detail. His father's. Now, in this case, though, so, ve'et imo. Im is a singular, his mother. He will leave the traditions of the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he will come from his mother, Imo, Mary. 
and he will do what? He will be ishto. He will cleave. Be in his wife. Be ishto. Not cleave. In. Do you see? Oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. Be. Be is in. Ishto. His wife. He will be in his wife. The Holy Spirit in you, the hope of glory dwelling within you as the temple of Almighty God. Vehayu le bashar echad. And it will be in the flesh as one. Showing that the Most High dwells not in the temple made with hands, but a body hast thou made for me, and that he would become one with that body, even in you, the hope of glory. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Mm. Now, let's, before I go into Genesis 3, now let's look at Exodus. This is so beautiful. Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the farthest end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God unto Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. I want to make sure we're recording here. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. This is where I'll do a little bit more reading of Hebrew because I really want to make some emphasis. As I said to you earlier, in the middle of the bush, in the middle of the thorn bush, metoch was the ash, the fire. And notice that as well. When you look at the very thing that God, when Adam said that she came from man, the H, in the middle of the H is the Yod, the first letter for the divine name, we would say. Okay, just hold that thought in your mind. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire. And the bush was not consumed or eaten up. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush has not burned. And Moshe said, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Okay, who calls who calls to him? Well, you would say Yahweh. Ve'ikara, he called. Okay? He called. That little yod right there means he. He called. Eliav Elohim. God called unto him. Mitok, from the middle, Hasene, of the thorn bush. Ve'yomer, Moshe, Moshe. Ve'yomer, Hineni. And Moses said, Here am I. Ve'yomer al tikrav chalum shel nalecha me'al reglecha. Ki hamakum ashar ata omed aliyav. Adamat kodashu. This is very important. And 
I read this in Hebrew and you'll understand why. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Don't come too close. Put off your shoes. Shel nalecha me'areglecha. Okay? Take off your shoes from off your feet. Ki hamakum. Because the place, Hamakum, Ashar, Ata, of which you, Omer, are standing upon Aliyav. The place where you are standing on Adamat. The earth, the Adam, is a whole, he, Kodesh, who? It is holy, or he is holy. I believe it's the very place in where God had formed the very man figure that he would then put the very life of God inside of. Here you have a thorn bush there. There you have, it like, like representing the tree of life. And the bush was a fire, the ash, and it was not consumed. And Moses is standing on the very ground at his feet, right then and there, right? As I showed you that image, he's standing on this ground, and God says, don't come any closer until you've taken the shoes off of your feet, because the Adamat here is holy ground. I believe God had chosen the very place that man was formed at from the very dust of the earth is why he had to take his shoes off. Why else would it be holy ground? God doesn't just choose any place without there being a reason. So he takes his shoes off his feet. Moever he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon him. That very, by the way, I am the God of thy father. Literally again, I am the God of your fathers. It is a plural, avi, av, avcha, but it's a plural. Just like in Genesis, the prophecy. Therefore shall a man leave his father. Therefore shall a man leave his fathers. It's, it's unbelievable. Aviv. But he actually also, though, is letting him know. Moses is being told, this one is a prophecy of Christ. You're leaving your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But also, too, God was letting Moses know that he was a Hebrew. Remember, he was adopted by an Egyptian family. I am the God of not just your fathers, but your own father, your per you personally. Elochai Abraham, Elochai Yitzhak, the Elohai Yaakov. Let me move down further. He tells him he's going to come back. They're going to serve him on top of this mountain. This is where we have to get into this part as well because it has everything to do with 1 Corinthians here. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? I always thought that was kind of odd. What, what does that got to do with anything? But he asked that question. Ashar Ihaye Veyomer 
כה תמר לבני ישראל, אי היה שלחני אל יחם. Now, it's not only that God says to him, say to them, I am that I am, thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I have sent me unto you. But he goes on further to say in verse 15, right here, this is my name forever. Zeshmi leolam veze zachari ladora dora. Literally, he says to, them, to him, this is my name forever and from generation to generation. Notice, though, what's in there. The yod He and I am. Just like you saw in Genesis when he calls them Ish and Isha. She's from Meish, from the, within the fire of the man, the Yod, there's the Yod, and she is called Isha, the fire with the He. But you can't have a complete unit until they're back together in one. You cannot have God that is in the midst of the bush, one with you, until, as Philip said, if the woman ever enters into the man again, death will cease to be. What does that represent? It represents that life of God. It, when the two become one again, death ceases to reign in the mortal body. All right. Now, by the way, <laughs> going back to where Jesus said they had the keys of knowledge, right? They claim their separate tree is the tree of life. It's not. But oddly enough, though, they put the keter at the top of the tree. The keter is what we call the crown. And they say it's at the top of the separate tree because they say, why? It links between God and man. Well, in one way, that's right, but the Keter, the Sephiroth tree, is not the tree of life. Jesus Christ is the tree of life. That Sephiroth tree is nothing. But now, let's begin to look at this. Before we go right into Corinthians, let me just share with you one thing. In the book of Esther, okay, in the, uh, what is this, the sixth chapter, Let the royal apparel be brought which the king useth to wear, and the horse that he rideth upon, and on whose head a crown royal is set, keter. Not, not given, actually. Uh, uh, you know, the crown given is the crown of the king. Now, if you'll notice, though, that was Haman saying, what should be done to the man in which the king wishes to honor? And he tells him, you put the king's crown on him. You unite him back with the king, the source, Jesus Christ. All right? By the way, I think this is one of the only places is in the book of Esther that the word keter is actually used. And then also, what do we have here in chapter 7, I think it is? Or no, chapter 2 of Esther? And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight, more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown, literally he says, and he put Keter Melachot, the crown of the king, Be Ha'isha. On. Her head. Did you ever notice that even the word head, rosh, which is right there, also has the word fire, ash, in it? Because why? The ihaye, asha ihaye, is right above you, the source that you are. Now, let's begin to look at 1 Corinthians. That the source of every man is Christ. And the source of the woman is the man. In other words, she come from Adam. You just saw that, right? And the source of Christ is God. 
He said, I come from my father, I go back to my father. So don't get it mixed up. It was God manifested in flesh on the earth. But he had to, what, lay aside his priestly crown and come down and take on the form of man that he might redeem us unto God and bring us back. So don't get that confused. I understand that he is God manifested in the flesh. But as he says unto John, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Mm. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He had not died yet, so the Holy Spirit hadn't been able to be poured out so that you could receive it into yourself, bring that source back into you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I in you. Now let's look at Corinthians. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. If a man wears the crown and doesn't remove it, he blocks that oil of anointing. And this is why he would dishonor Christ. You see, if he covers his head, if he puts the ketad upon his head, he blocks that flow of the Spirit of Almighty God to unite him back to him with him. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. We'll deal with that separately. A woman that prays uncovered without a crown like Vashti, she has rejected her husband. Now think of that in the type of Christ as well because you could be single and it's the same thing. This is an analogy. She prays with her head. See, what does he say? Every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonors her head. And by the way, I'm going to show you. Let me just show you right now. Hang on. Her head, the covering for her head is a kata. Kata is the Greek word from keter in Hebrew. That is that royal crown. Okay, the royalty. So when she prays with her head, she needs to be covered with the royalty, not a physical crown, not a hat on her head. Okay, it is she is to pray with her head covered because it is the royalty. It is showing that she has one with her husband. It's like a woman that goes out and she's married and she doesn't wear a wedding band. Right? That's, he's only giving you a type and analogy. If we were to say it today and everything, you're married and everything. Oh, well, you don't wear, neither one of you guys wear a wedding band and everything, you know. Now, some people don't do it because they believe it's symbology of things that are not good. I mean, I get all that. I'm not, that's not the point. My point is, is in general, today, if you're married, you wear a wedding band. In the old days, if you were married, you had a, you wore like this little crown of women had on their head. And if one of the little, little thingies fell out of it, it's like the virtues or something, right? And so he's using that as a type there. You pray, you prophesy with your head covered, but it's actually speaking of you being one with Christ. One with your husband. Okay? So let's, let's continue on. She is showing she is one with her husband, which is a type of redemption. We are one with Christ and married to him. That's why every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. You see, because when she's praying, if the Holy Spirit is not in there, if her crown of Christ is not on upon her, where does the prayer go to? 
So if she is not covered with Christ, she is if she were shaven. And the shaven woman, by the way, Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 21 here. And see us among the captives of the women of the goodly form, and thou hast desired unto her, and wouldest take her to, to you to a wife, then you shall bring her to your house, and shall shave her head, and pare her nails. The woman with a shaven head in biblical times was a representative of a captive. Eve, when Satan took and beguiled her, he took her captive. It caused both Adam and Eve to fall. And we're going to go back to that in just a moment. But they both fail. This is why we have to have redemption. For if the woman be not covered, let her be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. That's just obvious. If a shaven woman is, is a prisoner and shown also, she shall be a type, she's a type of the bride of Jesus Christ. And this is why he's, Paul is using this as an analogy. Don't forget Matthew 13 and verse 13, I believe it is, like I shared with you just a little bit ago and everything. Therefore I speak to them in parables because they seeing see not and hearing they hear not. Neither do they understand. How many people have never understand 1 Corinthians too caught up in dogmas? For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. See, Christ is the crown. The woman, the glory of the man is an allegory. We are from Feminine in spirit ourselves. We are, whether you're a man or a woman, we're considered to be the what? Bride of Christ. So when he's talking about a man not to, to cover his hat, he ain't talking about you having a hat on your head. No. That keter is a royalty crown. It is, it is, it, do you realize that it represents divinity? For as much as he is the image of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. A bride of Christ, a woman, one with her husband, signifies the redemption itself. Okay, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And again, though, keep in mind, as I showed you, Ezer, she was brought as a helper, was not a subordinate way of being. Now notice what it says here, though, verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. Power now, because of the angels. Do you know the word because right there in verse 10 can be easily translated. It means just as much to avoid the angels. Because this caused the woman to have power. Wow. Power? I thought the covering... How in the world is your hair or a hat, either one, going to give you some kind of superhuman power. It's not. But when you take that covering as the, let's look at it like, look at the story of Esther, right? When the king took the crown from Vashti because she dishonored her head and placed it upon Vashti, she came under the king's authority. And she was protected as a result of that authority. And as long as she held that crown and wore that crown, that power was upon her. She was able to subdue and conquer nations. 
devils, demons, anything else that come against her. That woman had what? Because she had power. She had authority. And when a woman is crowned with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, she has authority that no other woman could ever have. But it says on her head, why? Not because of the angels, to avoid the angels. And we're, he's talking about those fallen angels of Genesis chapter 6. When she's one with her husband, what did, what did, what did I tell you Philip said? If the woman ever enters back into her husband, death will cease to be. Death came. Those, those demons, those devils came to cause death in the human body bringing corruption, the fallen angels creating a, a bloodline of evil demonic entities. But if she's crowned with Christ, the Holy Spirit within her, those fallen angels cannot take hold of her. They cannot use her for any ill purpose. Then he goes back and he brings it right back again to source again. Neither the less Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, in other words, Eve come out of Adam, even so is the man also by the woman. Jesus Christ came by Mary, but all things of God. In other words, put it all back together again and you'll be back one with God. Judging yourself, this is where he gives you another allegory. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. Now this is what I found so interesting. A covering, right? Right? A, a Qatar. No. Her hair is not the royal diadem or the diadem on her hair, on her head. Let's take a look. Up here, when she was to be covered, it was with a kata. Not to take off the, or the, the Greek word for kater, the royal crown, which represented royalty. But when you deal with the hair that, that Paul talks about, let me let me get this here. Got to find where I can make it turn over. Oh, there we go. There we go. But when he says her hair instead of a covering, it is a pira leu. It's not a royal covering. So now you know when he talks about the hair, he's not talking anything about royalty. He's only showing you in the natural. Now Paul breaks it down to a natural. If she has long hair, you know, it is, it is given to her for a covering. All right? But it had nothing to do with a hat. It has nothing to do with the royal crown of God. It is strictly... But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering, but not a royal covering, just a natural covering. But if a man seem to be contentious, we have no such customs, neither the churches of God. He's only talking about there, about the hair issue. In other words, you don't have to argue about whether or not she has long hair or short hair. It's, that's not really the issue. That's what he's trying to say. The issue is not about the physical hair. It was about the glory of God that was upon you. That's what it was all about. All right. Now, let me make sure I didn't leave anything out in here, right? Let's see, Luke. We already got into that there. Um, Oh yeah, this is also about that having that keys to the kingdom. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? By the way, Matthew chapter 7. And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. See why? They did not. They were, did not have that crown of glory. They had not become one with Jesus Christ. See, um, 
And we did. We went into that already. And that day you shall know that I'm in the Father, you are in me, and I in you. That's what the true mystery of that is all about. We got into Exodus. We did that already. Um, uh, we went into this one as well. The blood. Okay. Yeah, we went into this because I did it from uh, from I think it was from Luke's Gospel. There, it's where Jesus he brings upon them the indictment unto you the blood of every righteous one which has been poured out into the earth from the blood of Abel and to the righteous and to the blood of Zechariah the son of Barcaia whom you killed between the temple and the altar. Truly I say unto you that all these will come upon this generation upon Jerusalem who kills the prophets and removes those who were sent. How many times I wish to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you would not. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians. You know, let me just touch on this real quick too in closing right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Because, like I said, you know, there there are so many women that are just under the bondage, and it's really terrible what's happening in this day. The types and shadows are definitely out there, and I and I, you know, I might say this for a different teaching here, but let me just say this: these two verses, verse thirty-four and verse thirty-five, these were in the margin of the Bible, and I should say that for a day when I can do that, because. There is no commandment within our scriptures that says a woman is not is not permitted to speak. Uh, they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. There is no law in the in the uh, anywhere within the Tanakh, the Old Testament. That is the writings, the prophets, nor the the teachings of Moses that a woman is to remain silent, as also saith the law. It is a Talmudic law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. The only place, and I'll have to show you that in the Talmud, is where it does say in the Talmud that it is it is forbidden for a woman to speak in the synagogue. Her voice is to not be heard. This is why Paul said, what? He asked the question, what? Came the word of God out from you or came it from you only? See? They act like these men of that day acted like they had the authority to do the speaking. And only they had the authority. And they, so they made a law in the Talmud that said that a woman was forbidden to speak within the synagogue. You know, totally false, totally false. We'll go into that another time. Anyway, I want to thank you for, for being here today, listening to this message. And I, I really encourage you, if this is a blessing to you, we do need your support, your help. Uh, please visit IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can donate online just by clicking right here online. Uh, by the way, this teaching right here uh, on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, at Steve and Yana Chat, it is on the laws of Noah that they claim to be, those seven. Uh, very important message. I had to take that down from this channel here because there is a huge risk in having that up. Uh, and uh, so, but, uh, but, you know, so definitely, if you want to see that, watch it here. But you can donate online by clicking right there and donating. We thank you. Or uh, Danun Institute, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Uh, or Stephen Benun, B-E-N-N-U-N, like you see on the screen right here. That's the way my name is spelled there. Uh, always do it either just in my name, Stephen Benun, or Danun Institute, uh, that is the easiest way to do that. God bless you. Thank you for listening, and and have a blessed day. Don't forget to support our Patreon channel too, patreon.com uh, forward slash Israeli News Live. Good way to support the broadcast as well. And also too, let me just mention this in closing. Those of you that are part of Lifeway with us, uh, we have a Zoom meeting tonight. Uh, you definitely want to come uh, to that Zoom meeting. There is always, we're always teaching new things there and uh, so many new testimonies. John is going to show women how that are losing their hair, how X39 has caused her hair to grow back. Uh, you can literally see it because it's like the short strands of it, really thick. Her hair has gotten really thick again. Uh, amazing what that has done. So, But if you want to sign up and order the products, I'll put that in the description below, lifewave.com forward slash Benun, B-E-N-N-U-N. But don't forget, the Zoom meeting tonight is at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and, uh, and you can join us there on Zoom. Uh, it is www.x39hub.com. 
So we'd love to have you out. God bless.